Hi, it's me, Tamala, and you're watching Soul Kisses TV. And today we are speaking with the majestic, the regal, the talented Terry Williams. <laughs> fire about is mental illness in our community. So God told you, okay, to use what you've been going through, which was yes. depression, yes. to help others. And how yes. have you helped others? I wrote a book, first of all. Black pain is the result of all the unresolved pain, wounds, and trauma, and scars of our lives. When you say violence, what do you mean? Do you mean in the media, or do you mean in real life? I mean both, in the media and in real life. The other and another issue about how depression and anger looks like, what it looks like in our community, is that there's so much violence everywhere we turn. When you say violence, what do you mean? Do you mean in the media or do you mean in real life? I mean both, in the media and in real life. If we think about the fact every single day we hear about someone being shot down or stabbed in cold blood. And when you witness those acts of violence and then you get up and go to work or school the next day like you didn't just see that, it's going to be very, very traumatic. And the signs are there. Like for kids in school who, who witness that and then get up and go to school the next day, they can't function properly because of what they just saw. Yes. But nobody ever understands, is aware of the importance of, if it's a child, small child, going with a psychologist into a room and drawing pictures about what it is that they have seen. I'm getting a little bit emotional as you talk to me about violence as a child because I grew up in Brooklyn and we always heard gunshots. Mm. And you know that somebody was getting shot, you yes. know? Yes. And I remember, you know, seeing, you know, people getting jumped. And yes. it kind of was just normal. Like, no one spoke about it, you know, like. Because that's what happens yes. in the neighborhood. Yes. So I can totally understand and relate to what you're saying about it having it has effects. a profound effect. Yes. And if if you were at a therapist's office, because sometimes when I go to my therapist's office, sometimes I oh I can't think of anything to say. But something's gonna come up and you are gonna start talking and that's when the tears flow and you really realize that something has had a very, very, very profound effect on you. You know? Yes. Uh, you get if, if someone is is someone is stabbed and you know lives through it or whatever you got to go and talk about that. If there's a death in one's family, got to go and talk about that. One of the disturbing facts about the increase of violence and people of all ages witnessing it, but in particular kids who are in school, is that because of the trauma that you witnessed, you get in that classroom and you can't function. You're bouncing all over the place because of what you just saw but you never had a chance to process it. Nobody asked you how you thought. You're not visiting a therapist, you can't function. And when you start being disruptive in the class, then we get labeled with ADD, mm. ADHD, and put in special education classes. And that's how and why kids are being looked at from early ages to see how many more prison beds they can build because they know for a fact this kid's not gonna make it. That is very deep. I have a question though. You mm. mentioned in your book about how we self-medicate because we don't go out and talk to therapists. Like in mm. what ways do you think that we cope? Like, cause we're not seeing therapists, so how do we cope? Oh, we, we drink, we take drugs. We have promiscuous sex, unprotected sex 
It's lethal, yeah. you know? Yes. Yeah. So there are a whole host of, we will do anything, gamble, we'll do anything to run from the pain, to not feel the real pain that we're in. You, you know people, you see people every day who's, who are just self-medicating. Why are you drinking so much? Why are you eating so much? You're overweight, overweight, but you're still eating because you're in pain and it's not being vocalized. Do you think that most of us are aware that we're in pain or that we're just mm -hmm. kind of asleep to it? That's a very good question. I think that unless somebody like pulls your coat on it, then you don't necessarily know that that's what you're doing. I think that we are asleep to our pain. And the only way we wake up is if we do something pretty terrible. Hmm, like hit rock bottom you mean? Like hit rock bottom, um, eating so much food that you literally can't fit through a door. You're miserable, you are dying, but all you want to do is just feed that, that ache I love that you say you. that because people think that, oh, obesity is just, you know, they're just lazy. No. But I do, I agree with you that no, you're obviously it's, it's, overcompensating for something. For something. You're feeding Some, something. Feeding yes. something. Yes. yes. And, and that's why I said it's all those areas that I mentioned before that those are ways of running from our pain. People, we see people, women having having sex with and not just they can't do it by themselves but we see people having sex just having more and more children that they cannot afford to have running from the pain we'll do anything to not feel what's really and truly bothering us all of us you and me yes i i <laughs> i will admit to that that i do wear a mask as well mm -hmm. you know and part of the soul kisses is me trying to also empower myself to you know Unleash the you know champion. Because you know what you need. Yes. That's a, that's a wonderful thing to unleash the champion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Unleash. Unleash. Unleash the champion yeah. in you. That's, that's what I want to do. In your ideal world, what, what impact would your book, Black Pain, have? Well, I would just love to see a, pe a, a more peaceful, satisfying um, atmosphere in which we live and grow and for people to reach their best potential. That's what's happening, we're wasting away because we're getting murdered. Like at every turn, something is happening and we get murdered. Somebody yells at somebody, goes off. Who knows what was really behind that, but that person's now gone. So the, the, the end result would be for us to be healthier and more successful in life, being able to make our own way is what I would love to see have happen. You launched the book five years ago. Do you think things are getting better or worse? Do you think you're becoming more dysfunctional or? Both, I think both. I think that there are a lot of us who are healing. I know because I get letters from people who are going to talk to a therapist. I have a friend who has known for years that his mother needed to seek counseling and she was always, always against it. Then she sees, <laughs> I'm doing an interview about Robin Williams's suicide. Are you? Yes. Okay. So I, I, I talk about it there and I talk about my own depression and how I began to heal. And this guy calls me up stunned that his mother called him and said, you've been saying for years that I needed to talk to someone, I'm ready. And just the letters that I get from the book, people, it's like we haven't named it. We're not, it's not something that we're, accustomed to we're accustomed to having not enough or just less than we don't we don't get what we deserve so you don't know that there are things that will help you feel better there was a little girl who was shot in Harlem in her in her knee Recently, for her leg or? Uh, I want to say about a year ago okay and I'm reading this interview in the Daily News and this mother says uh, that every time she hears a loud sound in the house or outside, she starts screaming and crying. That's called post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, her mother doesn't know that that has a name. Yes. Do you know? I, I get it. <laughs> she doesn't know that she has a name. All she knows is that baby is crying because she was shot. She sh that little girl should be in a room with a psychiatrist, a psychologist, and drawing pictures because it would come out. You have a whole generation of people who are, are impacted by the violence every single day that we witness. 
So you mentioned that, you know, this little girl, because she was shot, has mm -hmm. PTSD. Do you think there are millions of other people that oh are like that? Everywhere, that are... everywhere we turn. There's nightly, there's unspeakable violence. Nightly unspeakable violence. There are probably more people in these United States who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder because of the, viol the violence that we witness every single day than there are war veterans. That's really sad. How do we change this? How do we well, break the cycle? You know, I mean, there are organizations that, that are helping. Um, I do think that there's a young man, Jason Davis, who's a member of the Bloods, that uh, I adopted. He's a very- Legally? No, just of, it you... was in, informal. I just took him under my wing. Okay, why? Because I saw his heart and his spirit, even though he's someone who inflicted a lot of harm and damage on people, but I saw his heart and soul. Even while I was working with him, he was <laughs> most wanted in the state of Delaware. So I'm, <laughs> I'm wondering <Yay>! to myself, <laughs> I saw his heart and I saw his spirit and I saw that he was trying to help the brothers who were still out there gangbanging. He was trying to uh, direct them to a more safer and healthier way to move through the world. And so I ended up taking them to corporations to, so that they could have the experience of having a meal in a, in a boardroom. Wow. Uh, took them to many different events. Susan Taylor had an event at her home that was for 200 women. And I said, I want to bring these two young men who I mentor who are bloods. And she didn't bat an eyelid, you know? And so they had an opportunity to see the other side of life. And the women who were there had an opportunity to talk to someone that if they knew he was a blood, and they found out once he was, once they were there, but if they knew that that's who they were talking about, I was, oh no, I would never talk to one. But we're all human. We are human. We are all the same. The ones who were at the party were just dressed up nicely. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's true. We don't know how, how crazy they are. Because you all have a little bit of crazy. Yes, we don't do. Don't lie, you know you do we, too. We walk, we walk. <laughs> We walk that fine line. Yes. yes, we walk that fine line. Yes. What other um, issues do you address in your book? Taking a look at what depression looks like in men, what it looks like in women, what it looks like in children, what it looks like in the church, and just generally, just where how it manifests itself in different populations, different age groups. And the young man that I was mentioning, Jason, um, experienced horrific domestic violence in his home when he was growing up. So those are things that you just don't ever forget. But he's one of the kindest, most special people on the planet. And he goes in, talks to young people, and he tells them the cold truth about what it's like to be a, a, a member of a gang. He's, he is not playing, not on his watch. Is, is this cycle going to continue? There was a book conference and Jason and a colleague were talking about their lives, their upbringing. And he said, oh, and I told him about the Susan Taylor story. And I said, I know there are a lot of bougie Negroes who would never knowingly let a gang member into their home. And so this woman gets up, what's the matter? <laughs> so, no, but bougie it's, Negroes. it's, yes, Susan Taylor would be defined as a bougie Negro, all those women were, she's not, but the rest of those people that were, many of them were bougie Negroes. Mm -hmm. So I say this at the conference, and this woman gets up, she said, Terry, I'm one of those bougie Negroes that you talk about, and she said to Jason and Jawi, I want to know how I, I want to know how I cannot be afraid of you when I see you in the public, in public. And what do you say? Well, he, what he said was, well, it starts with your knowing my story now. If you knew what a person's life was like, nine times out of ten, you would treat them more compassionately. And so that's the thing, to know that everybody has a story. When you see somebody doing something that is, seems evil and or wicked, you, the question that you want to ask is, what's wrong with them? Yeah. That's not the question that we're supposed to ask. The, the question, question is, what happened to that person? Because that tells everything. I remember this girl in Brooklyn, 16 years old, in and out of trouble, lived with her aunt and honor student cousin. Long story short, um, she stabbed her cousin 49 times, slashed her throat, took her iPod, her cell phone, and the sneakers off her feet. 
somebody violated that little girl 100 years ago and she never ever got over it so how do we heal go to therapy talk to somebody yes and and take a layer of the mask off is what we need to do it's those those are the key ingredients uh, if there's been a death in one's family or you witness something particularly horrific you need to have counseling. You need to grieve and you need to get to the heal to a healing place. And the only way that's going to happen is with professional guidance. I do have one final question. At the end of the journey mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you're with your maker mm -hmm. and you're like, ooh, I've used all the gifts that have been given. What do you want your legacy to be? I tried to make a difference. That's, that's really it, that if I, ever, if I ever saw pain or suffering or someone who needed help, then I would know that there was something that I needed to do or say or just communicate so that they would feel better. Any last thoughts that you want to share? What can we expect from Terry in the next year? How can we help our brothers and sisters? Anything. We can help our brothers and sisters is to just acknowledge that they matter. When, you, when we walk down the street in, say, Harlem, sometimes I walk down the street, you know, where, um, where there's a lot, of, a lot of grief and suffering, I will just look somebody in the eye and just smile and say hello. But sometimes they will turn around to see who I'm smiling at because they know that they don't matter. Mm. So I think that in, in an instant, we can all make a difference to acknowledge people, to let them know that they matter. Because everything around us says, you don't matter. So to make somebody feel like they matter, oh, doesn't get any better than that. What a blessing, what a gift, Terry. Thank you, oh, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, guys, we're gonna sign off for now. Terry, thank you for your time. Mm. Dance with me. Oh, Dance see, I told you I was shy. No, Can you're I do not that? Shy. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Not shy. <laughs> Bye, guys. Take Those back. kisses Take to back. me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank, mm. you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Know. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely.